Morning, uh, U.S. history students. Here's our next installment, next lecture. No fancy, no glitzy intro. So I want to get this out to you as quick as possible. I uh, hope you're doing well, and I'm going to try to be as brief as possible as we sum up and finish the Vietnam War. Uh, so this is uh, Thursday. This is, what, May 28th, uh, getting this out to you. So I hope you enjoy as we conclude our lecture on the Vietnam War, and obviously you're able to go find other resources, and as you're working on your project, uh, just dive into specific aspects of the war that you're interested in and uh, doing your creative project uh, based on that. But hope you're doing well. It's always great to check in with you. And I know some of you enjoy these lectures, so thank you for your comments and encouragement. And for those of you that don't enjoy it, eh, it's just a grind. I'm sorry. It's, it's what I am sometimes. Uh, but let's hop right in it then. And where we left off last week was talking about the hawks and doves. And the Hawks uh, were supporters of the war and wanted to urge government to step up their war efforts to win. The Doves uh, were against the, with, uh, w the war and wanted the withdrawal of U.S. troops and then negotiated into the war. Uh, we talked about this last week, but what we start to see is there's a lot of Americans that were in support of the war. And then the shift happens after the Tet Offensive in uh, the end of January and February of 1968, there's this major shift that happens in the American uh, support of Vietnam. And so you start to see that the doves start to outweigh the hawks, so those that want to continue in the war. So basically from 1968, 68 becomes the turning point and where eventually more Americans are trying to get us out of World War II, uh, World War II, uh, the Vietnam War. And so we're going to see protests ramp up. We're going to see even government politicians like Lyndon Johnson is going to run for the uh, re-election in 1968. But then he's like, oh, wait, I see how unpopular I am because I'm carrying on this Vietnam War and I don't necessarily have a good exit strategy. Peace talks are not working. So he actually chooses not to run for a second term as president of the United States. And so that ushers in. Not a Democrat like Lyndon Johnson was, but a Republican who uh, wins the election in 1968 uh, on a platform of having peace in Vietnam with honor. That's what uh, Richard Nixon was running for in 1968. So, as I mentioned, war protests are going to increase. Those baby boomers, if you remember from 1945, if you were born in 1945 to 1960, they're now, in the, we're talking in the late 60s, early 70s, they're in college. And only about 12% of baby boomers are going to protest the war, so not a huge chunk. But we normally think it's all these college students, young people that are protesting. Yes, there were a lot of them, many of them uh, in this uh, age bracket. Uh, but what historians believe, economics uh, professors believe, that these this group of baby boomers grew up with economic stability, especially through the 1950s and 1960s, so they could afford to be idealistic and rebellious and uh, be kind of hippie-ish and, you know, seek uh, alternative lifestyles than we had really not seen in American culture up to this point because they didn't necessarily have to work to support the family. They could go get education and uh, think about these ideas philosophically, whereas previous uh, generations and demographics were not able to. And they had experience with the civil rights movement, right, of the 1950s and 60s, where they're engaging in mass protest uh, in a nonviolent protest, for instance, and so that's going to carry over into protesting against the Vietnam War. So by 1967, 70% of the American people believed that these protesters were uh, acting disloyal to the American government, but this is going to kind of uh, change through 1968 and on as the Vietnam War is going to continue to fight on. The media, uh, about 60 million Americans, which is about a third of Americans, watch the nightly news. Uh, to get their news, and newspapers, obviously, a, another great source. We didn't have the internet at the time. Uh, so, But what the media is portraying, as far as the Vietnam War, is a real televised war, where you're seeing clips, not in real time, but pretty close to that, and you're seeing kind of the goriness of war, how devastating war is, and basically that war is hell, right? And that's kind of what a lot of the soldiers are speaking to. They get interviewed uh, as they're fighting in Vietnam as well. And so by 1968, at the height of the Vietnam conflict, there's about 800 reporters covering Vietnam, going over there and, and videoing and, and re recording and taping uh, our soldiers. So it became a very graphic way to see the war, which also is going to encourage Americans to 
discontinue their support. And well-known, respected uh, news anchors, like the most important is, at this time is Walter Cronkite. Uh, that's who uh, uh, Ron Burgundy is passion, uh, fashioned after in Anchorman, if you've seen those movies, uh, after Walter Cronkite. But he's even going to cast doubt on whether America should be fighting in the Vietnam War on his nightly uh, news broadcast, which is going to kind of sway uh, people to uh, not be encouraged to support the war. Okay, And there's going to be a couple of major protests in which protesters are going to be killed, and this further kind of changes the dynamics in America and American culture to not support the war. Uh, one of the most famous is Kent State. It's basically students were surrounding the ROTC building. It's the Reserve Officer Training Corps building. That's where you can go to college and at the same time you're training to be an officer in the military like the Army, Navy, Marines. And uh, you can do both, go to college and train for the military simultaneously. Well, students surrounded it, pelted it with firecrackers. The National Guard was called out in Ohio. And the National Guard ended up opening fire on this group of protesters uh, because uh, they thought they heard gunshots, and so they were returning fire in self-defense. It ended up not being true. We necessarily don't know uh, what the initial sound was that sparked uh, the National Guard to open fire, but it ended up being a tremendous tragedy because you have these students protesting that ended up being gunned down. So 11 students were wounded and four died. Ironically, one was actually training to be in the military, a member of the ROTC, and two of the students killed were just crossing on a pathway to lunch. Here's one very famous picture. The friend that was walking with this gentleman, just he dies on the spot, and she's like literally can't believe it, and there happened to be a photographer there to take the picture. So the whole world, world watches and sees, wow, things are getting messed up in America, all these protests. Now protesters are being gunned down when they're protesting semi-peacefully. I mean, they're throwing crack, firecrackers and rocks. So, uh, But this is when things are getting really ugly within America as protests rage on about whether we should be in Vietnam or not. There's another kind of lesser known protest that happened at Jackson State University in Jackson, Mississippi. It's an all black or historically black college, kind of a similar instance. There's a lot of uh, African-American students that were protesting. The National Guard's called in because it's getting kind of chaotic. And a bottle fell from a dorm window and crashed. Uh, and then the National Guard heard this, thought they were being fired upon, and they themselves also opened fire on the crowd of protesters. For 30 seconds, 11 students also wounded, but instead of four dead, in this instance, only two students died. And here's their memorial on the campus of Jackson State University. So, And also, African-American historically black colleges are going to be protesting against the war because they feel that they're disproportionately drafted because there's sort of less opportunities to get the deferments to get out of being drafted to go to the Vietnam War. So in Woodstock, a very famous uh, music festival, you might have heard of it, is going to happen uh, in the summer of 1969. And it's going to kind of be a showcase of many of the uh, major bands at the time that are assembling basically to protest the Vietnam War. So a lot of this protest music that we now call classic rock, it's famous at the time because it's protesting against the war, and a lot of these uh, artists are going to be very outspoken against the war. And so Woodstock was thought to draw maybe 120,000 people in this middle of this dairy farm uh, in, uh, in New York State. Actually, there's about 400,000 that actually attended, and if you've heard the reputation of Woodstock, it's basically like people going crazy. Uh, doing drugs, uh, you know, overdosing on drugs, uh, coming down off of acid trips, and there's actually a couple babies that were born. I don't know which pregnant women are going, nine months pregnant, but uh, I believe it was three babies were born throughout this three-day festival, and uh, who knows how many babies were made, right? That's the, some of the allegations uh, of Woodstock as well, but it's mostly white, middle, upper class, you know, uh, young people that have the money to travel to New York and have the time to just uh, kind of go crazy for three days. And a lot of our music, music festivals hope to be like Woodstock, how awesome or crazy it was. And uh, I'm sure you've heard of those, like Coachella and whatnot. But they've had, they try to do, have redone Woodstock a couple times, and it always kind of falls flat and has never been that successful. So they just had, or tried to do, was it the 50th anniversary? Uh, was it last year, 60th anniversary or something? I can't remember, last year, but... Uh, it ended up just falling. They didn't even host it because there wasn't enough support. So anyways, uh, one of the most tremendous tragedies in terms of uh, 
that we know about of uh, civilians being harmed in the Vietnam conflict is what's called the My Lai Massacre, in which about 347 unarmed civilians, women, old men, children, were massacred uh, by about 100 members of U.S. Charlie Company, commanded by William Cowley. And uh, My Lai was a village in South Vietnam where we suppose that there was Viet Cong uh, men and women participating, supporting the Viet Cong. And so we just went into this village looking for the Viet Cong, couldn't find any. Well, let's just get rid of all of them. And unfortunately, uh, this whole village was decimated. Uh, so many people were herded into ditches to be shot. Women were raped by American servicemen, and then the village burned to the ground. And then the government had a cover-up until... Uh, there actually were pictures taken, so this is pictures of the of the village of Mai Lai and the massacre of the people. Uh, but there was a veteran who was involved who got out of the service, and he just couldn't live his life knowing that he had uh, perpetrated in these actions against these unarmed civilians, many of which you know might have been Viet Cong, but we had no clue. And uh, so he threatened to go public, and so the army ended up. Uh, releasing and it kind of leaked out the photos of this and so they put William Cowley the commander on trial he was convicted sentenced to life in prison but it was later overturned because uh, it was kind of found that he was suffering PTSD post-traumatic stress disorder and you know uh, so the government was kind of trying to protect him and and uh, kind of justify the unjustified actions that he committed uh, he didn't really he served a little bit of jail time, but was released uh, before serving any of his life sentence. Uh, so again, there's a victims, multiple victims, not just those civilians, but also we're starting to see the military soldiers were also victims. Where uh, they're feeling like you know they don't know who is the enemy, fearing that everyone's the enemy, so they're just whole scale going to commit mass atrocities against people against the Vietnamese country. And so this is where it starts to really get ugly. Another way it was ugly is uh, American uh, uh, military is going to try to root out the jungle. If you remember, we were trying to find where the Ho Chi Minh Trail is from the north, supplying from the north to the south, and the Viet Cong in the south with all these supplies. Uh, and we want to destroy it so that the supply chain uh, can be destroyed and that the Viet Cong will eventually collapse. So how do we do it when it's in a jungle? Well, we got to kill the jungle, kill the trees, let's destroy uh, the vegetation so I could actually see down and we could see people walking. We could see uh, through the jungle to where the Ho Chi Minh Trail is at. And so what we dump at uh, wide scale with crop dusters throughout the jungle is what's called Agent Orange. It's probably one of the most uh, deadliest uh, in terms of uh, herbicides to kill plants that has ever been used uh, in, the, in the world. And it's actually, you might have a bottle of it in your home right now. So the company that made it is called Monsanto, and they've been a very controversial company throughout the last decades. But they made Agent Orange and got rich off of Agent Orange because the government was buying it. But now you might have a version of Agent Orange in your garage called Roundup. So if you've heard of the product called Roundup, which kills weeds and uh, stuff throughout your yard, well, that was it's a, like a little cousin of Agent Orange. And so part of the mass and unfortunate effects of Agent Orange a chemical defoliant to, so to get rid of foliage and the jungle but it c contains a deadly poison dioxin which ingested by people is uh, very harmful and so it, we estimate it killed maybe 400,000 Vietnamese civilians and also people from Laos and Cambodia but it's going to lead especially to major birth defects in children uh, from mothers that are affected by dioxin so it's going to lead to uh, mental retardation spina bifida which is uh, the not the formation uh, of the spinal cord is not allowed to develop in over a half million children. So there's still major effects left over and it's going to destroy wildlife as well and contaminate the waters. Uh, and so there's still, you know, even 50, 60 years later, a major uh, sort of dent taken in the nature and the environment of Vietnam through uh, the use of Agent Orange. We have uh, about a thousand American servicemen that you know, would attach Agent Orange in the huge barrels and fill up these barrels on the American crop dusters. About a thousand of them have had early incidents in cases of cancer. They've had uh, the same things happen where they're trying to father children and issues uh, with that and birth defects in their own children here in America, uh, all related to this Agent Orange and America's secretly, uh, well, not so secretly, but they've set up a fund uh, 
specifically to pay for the medical expenses of those thousand servicemen and their families uh, exposed to this Agent Orange. So, uh, so as uh, Nixon gets elected in 1968, uh, he gets elected in the mantra of peace with honor. And he's going to set up a plan to try to remove American troops from Vietnam called Vietnamization. Okay, and so he wanted more people in South Vietnam, specifically uh, the uh, South Vietnamese forces that we've been training with and that we've been fighting with to be able to take over the majority of the fighting so that American troops get a pull back and return back to America. And so by 1969, there's 36,000 U.S. troops killed in action in Vietnam. And, and uh, so advisors are telling Nixon it's going to take eight more years at least for America to win this war, to have you know, the continue to the escalation, continue the fighting. But Nixon just got elected with this idea of having peace in the Vietnam War. So he knows he can't spend his whole two terms, if he gets elected two terms as president, trying to win this war because he's going to be even more unpopular, especially when he just got elected under the idea of having peace. So he comes up with this Vietnamization. We're going to train South Vietnamese troops and take over what the U.S. has done so we can start withdrawing U.S. troops. And the first major withdrawal happens in November 1969, where 60,000 troops are withdrawn. And it's kind of like a major celebration for some American servicemen that were serving uh, to be pulled back. And it was only certain divisions and uh, regiments that that affected. But So we, for the first time, we start to see sort of the decrease, the de-escalation of the amount of troops serving in the Vietnam War. Okay, and so Nixon also starts peace talks, which had loosely happened, but we now try to ramp up our peace talk efforts with the North Vietnamese and Ho Chi Minh. And so we have, uh, we meet in Paris, Paris, France, the city of peace, supposedly, to try to talk peace in Vietnam. So the South Vietnamese leader, uh, his name is Tu, he's pictured right here, meets with Henry Kissinger, our Secretary of State at the time, representing the United States. We meet with leaders from the Viet Cong and also uh, the, the, the North Vietnamese as well. And so the North wants the United States out of all of Vietnam, North and South, and they want a combination South Vietnamese and Viet Cong government in the South. But of course, America and the South Vietnamese don't want to partner with the Viet Cong because they're communists and Therefore, uh, we agree that it's not going to work. What the South and the U.S. wants, we want all North Vietnamese troops to remove themselves back to North Vietnam, to the north of the 17th parallel, including the Viet Cong, and leave two in power so that the South stays a democratic capitalist government under two. Uh, but it ends up not working out. The peace talks fall apart because uh, the two sides are too far apart and they can't compromise enough. So how does America respond? Well, if you're not going to give us what we want, we're going to bomb you into submission to bring you back to the peace table uh, to have a peace deal. And so by March 1969, Nixon is going to order the bombings of not just North Vietnam now. Now he starts to expand the bombing, and this is one of the big critiques of Nixon. We start bombing other sovereign independent countries like Cambodia and Laos and uh, start bombing them to smithereens as well, trying to uh, bring uh, the North Vietnamese to the negotiating table. Okay, so and we said we'd stop our bombings if you negotiate. Well, this is going to go on for over uh, a couple of years. You see, it's finally going to take until October 1972 when the talks open again. This is on the cusp of the next presidential election when Nixon's running for election again. He's shown the American people, hey, I've de-escalated the number of troops there, and now I'm starting peace, peace talks again. So this is one of the reasons why he wins re-election again in 1972 uh, is because he's going to, uh, basically be trying to end the Vietnam War and the American public sees that and okay are encouraged by that and re-elect Nixon and that's you know in his second term when we get into Watergate which we'll talk more about next week but the North Vietnamese agree to drop Viet Cong leadership over South Vietnam and then the South Vietnamese agree to let the North Vietnamese troops stay in South Vietnam they don't have to remove themselves north of the 17th parallel anymore they can stay there uh, and hopefully have a truce a ceasefire uh, is is what is being discussed, but we also knew that in the end, if we left North the Vietnamese troops in the South, eventually they're going to continue to fight. The ceasefire is only going to last for so long, and eventually South Vietnam is going to be lost. Again, this agreement is going to fall through because the South doesn't sign because they know that they're going to lose if they leave the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong troops in the South. 
So, but America at this point is just like, we need out, okay? All right, South, and you say you're not going to sign, you're killing us. So, what are we going to do? Well, let's go kill some more North Vietnamese by bombing them some more. And so, December, after Nixon wins re-election, he authorizes some more bombings in North Vietnamese cities. Lots of civilians are going to die. But it had the effect of after a month's worth of bombing in January 1973, the North Vietnamese are going to return to the bargaining table to discuss peace in Paris. Okay, and so an additional compromise negotiation that we make with South Vietnam is we're like, okay, you guys are in charge still, and we're going to continue to support you. We'll give you money, we'll give you aid, and as the uh, North Vietnamese might stop the ceasefire, if they stop the ceasefire, then we'll send more advisors then how does that sound okay you have american military and financial support to go forward and so this was the last key to finally get south vietnam to agree to this deal uh the ceasefire between north vietnam and south vietnam and it's going to turn against uh south vietnam here in a second but in the four years since nixon started getting out of the war you see there's still a tremendous amount of casualties we estimate we killed 500,000 north vietnamese and Viet Cong troops uh, and then another 4,000 U.S. troops are killed in those four years that we are de-escalating and using Vietnamization to try to train South and Vietnamese forces to get out. Okay, and so the final straw comes two, uh, uh, two years later. So the last American troops officially left in March 1973. We are going to have advisors there. But the ceasefire that we negotiated with North Vietnam collapses, obviously, because there's still Vietnam and Viet Minh forces in South Vietnam. And they don't want to stop. They want to unify the country and have independence from America and uh, our influences over the capitalist democratic uh, South Vietnamese. And so two years later, by March 1975, the North Vietnamese launched a major events offensive against South Vietnam. And two is going to be like, hey, it's two years later after that deal you made with us. You're going to give us money. You're going to give us military weapons and keep your advisors here to help us. But in the end, Congress in 1975 was like, eh, no, I know we said that, but we are so tired. We don't like Vietnam anymore. You're on your own. And of course, uh, South Vietnam being on their own by themselves were not able to out kind of wit or outmatch the uh, North Vietnam forces and the military might, which had strong influence from the Soviet Union and China. And so by April 30th, 1975, North Vietnamese troops took over Saigon. Uh, the capital city, South Vietnam, and which later is renamed Ho Chi Minh City after their uh, leader for independence, Ho Chi Minh. And so it's still called that today. And they unify the country now under communism. And still to this day, Vietnam is a communist country, even though we, they now love Americans because we go there, spend money, and hang out on their beaches, and, but spend a lot of money and, and uh, bring that to Vietnam. So here's famous as here's the American embassy. As the North Vietnamese were uh, coming into Saigon, especially this is uh, the American embassy, the Americans that are there, and especially the South Vietnamese that worked with Americans, knew that they were going to be executed, slaughtered once they get captured because they're not communists and fought against the communists. So there's helicopter flights that were taken off on top of the U.S. embassy, and people are dangling from this ladder trying to get on top, trying to be some of the last rescued. And any uh, South Vietnamese that worked with America was granted uh, amnesty and asylum to go to America. And so if you made it on the helicopter, you're basically saved. I had a student several years ago whose mother was on one of the last flights out because uh, her husband was an American military commander. And uh, so very interesting, very crazy uh, story. Uh, so she was half American, half Vietnamese, and therefore qualified to get on the helicopter and be saved. So even locally, we have stories of the South Vietnamese refugees here in America uh, having an impact here in Bothell and in our area. So at the conclusion of the Vietnam War, yes, 1973, we pulled out, and then all of Vietnam is going to be unified by the communists in 1975. At the end of the conflict, about 2,500, 2,600 American troops were listed as missing in action. Like, we just don't know what happened, you know, might have been killed in the middle of the night, stepped on a booby trap or landmine, or they got bombed and literally disintegrated. And no one really knows what happens to them. And so since that time, about uh, 500 remains have been accounted for. This is in the 1990s, President Clinton was like, okay, we are going to formally have peace with uh, 
North Vietnam, you're a communist country, okay, we're, we're going to start talking again. Now American tourists can come over, and Vietnamese civilians can also come over and visit their family uh, if they want to. So that was a tremendous deal in the early 1990s. But at that time, we also sent over uh, pathologists to go look for remains of American soldiers. And we did end up accounting for about 500 American soldiers and their remains, so we know what happened to them. So it still leaves about 2,000 American servicemen unaccounted for that we just don't know what happened to them. Uh, you can compare that to the Vietnamese troops, both north and south. About 200,000 Vietnamese troops are unaccounted for, but we just don't know what happened to them. And uh, But we go over to Vietnam and we basically freak out about where are these American servicemen that fought here? We don't know. Uh, but the Vietnamese are just like, come on, I lost my grandpa or my father or even my mother. I have no clue because the numbers are just so uh, much more in terms of the Vietnamese. Also, another kind of blemish on the American servicemen that were there is about 50,000 mixed-race children were left behind by U.S. troops. So U.S. troops were fathering children with Vietnamese mothers and then also left those children there and mothers there. Uh, and so they have grown up and kind of been outcast of society because they are, you know, kind of uh, half uh, American and therefore the country of a former oppressor and so not looked at very well and then also Vietnamese like and usually they were uh, uh, created out of necessarily out of wedlock and so that's kind of shunned and abandoned in Vietnamese culture as well and so uh, by between 1985 and 1995 there's about 4,000 Vietnamese that have been killed or maimed meaning that they've lost a limb by unexploded bombs dropped from warplanes that exploded within this 10-year time period. And that's still a concern. The mines and some of the un unexploded ordnance is, is still out there, and it's in the jungle. Are people going to discover it ever and harm themselves? Hopefully not, but that's there. So I want to uh, describe the U.S. deaths in Vietnam versus uh, what we've seen in the Iraq War of 2003 uh, basically till 2009. Uh, and so if we look at the six years that we're in the Iraq war, you see the number of American deaths is really low. Uh, if I remember right, I believe it's 4,400 Americans are going to die in the Iraq war. Okay, And then here's the numbers compared to the Vietnam war in blue. And you see we spike in deaths per month. Uh, this is basically 1968, 69. And then we start to descend as we de-escalate and Richard Nixon's trying to pull out American troops. But you see the numbers of deaths, of American deaths in Vietnam, still way higher than what we experienced in the Iraq War in the 2000s. In total, there's about 58,000 Americans that are going to lose their lives in Vietnam. So it's a tremendous uh, proportion of uh, military deaths compared to... Uh, the Iraq War, which is only 4,400, so 4,400 deaths, and just to be able to compare them. Okay. And so, in the amount of spending, we're like, oh, how much did we spend on our military during these wars? You see the Korean War, we have a spike and then decrease. Here's the start of the Vietnam War. Again, it's the slow uh, ramp up, and then Johnson institutes the draft and sends over 500,000 troops. So we have this big bulge, and then Nixon starts to pull us out. And here's technically, right, when the uh, North Vietnamese take over South Vietnam in 1975. We kind of stop giving money to South Vietnam because they've collapsed and been taken over. And then you see, you know, as we go on later in history, Reagan builds up. And then, but here's the war in Afghanistan, Afghanistan, and Iraq. We spend a lot more money in proportion than we do in the Vietnam War. So we spend a lot more to go fight in Iraq and the Middle East, Afghanistan, than we do in the Vietnam War. So, but, so that's going to conclude our. Vietnam lecture, and I hope that was informative to you and that you enjoy uh, learning a bit about and dabbling into American history a little bit. I thank you for being here and for being uh, awesome students uh, during this time and educating yourselves from home. So uh, I'll see you soon. Have a great weekend, you guys.